I am Tracy. I'm one of the adult program specialists with the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. We're super happy you are here tonight with us. Uh, with me is Vez. Um, they are also an adult program specialist with the library, and we are hosting um, Leslie Meredith tonight. Uh, she is a member of the Arlington Heights Garden Club, and um, we are super excited to have her to talk about foodscaping, which uh, you're going to learn all about that in a few minutes. Uh, before we get started, though, I do want to let you know um, that this program is being recorded. Um, it doesn't really impact you much because we can't see or hear you. Um, but you can communicate with us via chat. Your chat will not be in the recording. So, um, you know, feel free to communicate with us, with each other. Uh, we are super happy to answer any of your questions. Um, I will be kind of following the chat throughout the program and uh, let Leslie know when she has some natural kind of breaks, you know, what the questions are. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it. Um, the chat feature, if, uh, you haven't found it um, is usually either right at the bottom or the top of your screen where it says like participants. There's a little thing that says chat. If you click on that, you're able to um, uh, talk to us. Um, you can talk to each other and uh, we're happy to answer any questions. So I think, let me see what time it is. It is 7.01. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Leslie. Uh, Vez and I are going to kind of go um, dark, so you won't see us, but we will be here to answer your chats, and um, you'll hear my voice every once in a while. But uh, without further ado, um, I introduce Leslie Meredith. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Introduction to Foodscaping. Um, it's interesting that Tracy was telling me when we were chatting earlier about saying that there's 130 people who had registered for this. So it's not totally surprising that this is popular in a pandemic. Um, the, the left side of the screen is just something that was in this month's Better Homes and Gardens. They had a whole feature on how to create an edible window box. The right side is an email from a, a seed company, Renee's Garden, that was trying to explain why they uh, were so sold out or long delays on getting seeds shipped. They said the demand has been eight to 10 times higher than any time in history. So everybody wants to garden in a pandemic and everybody wants to grow food. So that's kind of the, the setup. So foodscaping, um, what is it? Well, it's kind of what it sounds like if you, if you Think of the words food and landscaping and mush them together. That's foodscaping. Some people call it edible landscaping or ornamentables, which is hard to say, um, or even front yard gardening you might have heard of. It's essentially just anytime you're integrating food plants in with your ornamental garden. So rather than having a separate standalone vegetable bed or garden, you, you sort of integrate your flowers with your vegetables. Um, and it's becoming more and more popular um, for a number of reasons, really. First is just, it's a really easy, scalable way to, to grow your own food. So you don't have to have a huge garden. You can, you can make this as, as elaborate as you'd like, but it can also be as simple as a pot on your patio. And even if you have a year when you wanna give up on it, it's not like you have an empty patch of soil that was used to be your vegetable garden. You can just plant, you know, marigolds instead of tomatoes, and um, you know, have a have an off year. So it's it's really an accessible way to start growing food. Um, and and part of the great things about growing food are just uh, you know nutrition and flavor. So the fact that the food is so much fresher when you grow it at home versus the kind of food miles that uh, a lot of our food has to travel to get to our grocery stores. Um, I've got one quote here that Joe Robinson, she's an author um, and journalist who writes about food and nutrition. And she was on NPR's Fresh Air and talking about bagged lettuces that we all love, right? The pre-wash, pre-cut bagged lettuces. And a lot of us eat those because we think, oh, I'm gonna have some something healthy. I'm gonna get a really good nutrition boost. But a lot of those are, are two weeks from harvest to by the time it gets to the grocery store. And by that time they lose a lot of their nutrition, not to mention flavor. So that's, that's a big reason why uh, more people are drawn to this. The second is economic. So um, 
you know, it, it just costs less, maybe more sweat equity, but certainly less money. So an example with a tomato plant, a tomato, typical tomato plant will produce about 10 pounds of tomatoes. And I looked up uh, the going price for organic tomatoes on the vine from Whole Foods, it's $2.99 a pound. So you're talking $30 worth of tomatoes for a $3 plant or a, you know, three cents worth of one tomato seed. Um, so that's one aspect. And then there's just the environmental impact. Again, those food miles, that food doesn't have to be trucked on refrigerated trucks thousands of miles. It's literally right in your backyard. Um, and then finally, well-being. You may have seen um, a study just this month that was published about the, the emotional well-being score of different activities. And they found gardening was one of the top contributors or hobbies or pastimes or activities people could do to boost their emotional well-being and edible gardening even more so than other types of gardening. And what was interesting to me about the study is it was one of the few activities that even if you do it alone, it has the same emotional well-being as if you do it you know, with other people. So if you've got to be in quarantine, gardening is a, a good thing to be doing. Um, Foodscaping specifically um, has surprisingly large harvests. Um, one of the things you do in your foodscaping is you don't sort of have all your vegetables together separate from all your ornamentals, your flowers or your shrubs. You're sort of intermingling things and that sort of intermingling fools the critters basically. So if a bunny or a beetle or something gets into the food, it can't sort of decimate the whole buffet. It can, it sort of limits the damage. So you can get surprisingly good harvests out of uh, foodscaping techniques. And lastly, it's just the beauty. So um, hopefully you'll see as we go through the presentation, I've got a lot of pictures to share of how, how just strikingly pretty edible plants can be in, in the garden. So how we're gonna go through this is I'm gonna sort of break, break this up into four chunks based on the format um, of the edible gardening or foodscaping. So starting upper left, we've got all kinds of containers including hanging baskets and window boxes and, and what you can do with those formats. Then we've got um, all the vertical growing. So trellises, walls, uh, cages, fences, those sorts of vertical growing environments. Then beds, you know, typical foundational beds around the house or borders along pathways or driveways, even edging and, um, and ground covers, how you can use edibles for those purposes. And lastly, it's all the perennial trees and shrubs that actually produce fruit and in some cases nuts that are edible um, that, that may surprise us. So I'll pause there. Are there any questions, Tracy, or should I keep going? I'll keep going. Okay, so some of the things to consider when you're plotting out incorporating edibles in your garden. Um, sun is the biggie. Uh, most edibles need at least six hours of sun a day to be able to produce any kind of food. There are exceptions and I'm gonna flip ahead to the, the shade edibles. So here's a list of things that actually will grow okay in not deep shade, this isn't full shade, but partial shade, you can grow things like celery, asparagus, mint, spinach, kale, fennel, lettuce, parsley, all the greens, chard, um, even bush beans. Bush beans, you'll have lower yield, but you'll still get plenty of beans, um, onions, and garlic. Um, the second consideration is water. So especially if you're starting from seed, you're going to be needing to keep those seeds moist. So how are you going to get water to your garden? Where's the nearest spigot? Do you have a hose that's long enough? Are you going to use a rain barrel? So that's one of the factors to bear in mind. Um, and then favorites. So think about what you and your family really love to eat. I always like to look at what's super expensive in the store <laughs> because I feel like I'm, I'm cheating that way if I can grow like snow peas because they're so expensive to buy. Um, things that taste best fresh. That's why so many people grow tomatoes because a homegrown tomato tastes nothing like what you buy in the store. 
Um, and then hard to find varieties. So sometimes you can grow really fun things that are, just aren't available in the store. Uh, the fourth point to consider um, is color. So you kind of in foodscaping is you start with what you have. So if you think about where you're gonna grow food, what other colors are there? And, and it's not just the flowers, but the foliage, the fruit, what's, what's gonna look nice together. Following on that is also the size. So is this gonna be a, you know, how much room do you have? Is this gonna be a big sprawling plant? Is it going to be short and round, tall and spiky? What, what's gonna kind of fit in the space you have in mind? And then culture compatibility, that just refers to, you know, how much sunlight, how much water, um, a particular plant needs. So you want to have like with like. If you're going to be planting an edible in with something that likes a kind of cool, partially shady, moist environment, you're going to want to put a food plant that kind of likes the same thing because when you're watering, you're not going to be able to sort of just water one plant. They're all going to be sharing a similar culture. And then the last but certainly not least, maybe the most important point is building the soil. Uh, a lot of times, um, I'm finding this now in trying to grow some things in a bed that used to just be a bunch of shrubs and the soil is just pretty terrible. It's very heavy, it's clay based, you know, there's, it's compacted, there's not a lot of nutrition in it. So it, it's always a good idea to put, you know, a good four inches of any kind of organic matter like compost. And you don't have to dig it in deep, just in the surface of the soil is fine, or you can even let, apply it like a mulch and leave it for a couple of weeks before you plant your edibles. And the earthworms will do the work in a few weeks of just intermingling that organic matter to improve the structure and the, the nutrition in that soil. I already did that one. Okay, so part one is going to be um, containers. So you can see here, um, there's a hanging basket um, that has strawberries in it. I love this idea. Not a lot of people think, you know, that you can, you can plant strawberries, but they're going to just cascade all down out of that container. And on the right, ironically, is a strawberry pot um, that I just planted, but those are all just a whole bunch of different herbs that I have growing out of the holes that the strawberries uh, would be in. Um, so here's a list of some of the edible plants that do really well in containers that you maybe never thought about growing in a container. So strawberries and herbs we just saw, but lettuce is a great one to, to put in a container. There's a whole bunch of flowers that are edible that look beautiful and you can add to salads and make all kinds of interesting cocktails out of and baking goods. Um, tomatoes, if you get uh, the determinant variety, meaning they're going to be compact or bush varieties that aren't going to, you know, turn into 12 foot monster vines. Eggplant, same thing. They make varieties that are specifically bush type or compact for containers. Peppers, cucumbers, summer squash, blueberries, potatoes, beets, kale, Swiss chard, and carrots. So quite a, quite a list. And there is a, an example of a lettuce bowl, although it's actually a mescaline mix. So there's a whole bunch of different greens that honestly, this is the, this is the baby step one that anyone can do. It's literally, I had a packet of mescaline seeds, you throw them in, up over the surface of the bowl and within a couple of weeks you have salad. <laughs> so that's really, really easy. Um, I use leaf lettuce, so you know, you. The nice thing, if, you're, if you kind of want this garden to be pretty, if you grow head lettuce, then when you harvest it, you have to kind of harvest the whole head and then you have a hole and you have to plant something else or figure it out. But leaf lettuce is beautiful because you can just cut a few leaves for your salad and it'll, it'll grow back. So it's, they call it cut and come again because you can keep harvesting leaves and it'll still look good and fill in with, with new growth. Um, here's a couple other bowls I have right right now. So on the left, that's a really pretty leaf lettuce called appropriately Sea of Red. Um, and that's just an old, I don't even know what that tool is. I have a bunch of old vintage 
kitchen tools and weird farm implements and gadgets that I stick in the container just to make it look kind of kind of artsy and cool. And those are Asian baby greens on the right. So I can, you know, the salad is literally out my back door and the stir fry is out my front door. Really, really easy to do. Um, and here is the window box I have um, outside my shed. And so this was last year and I grew, there's strawberries at either end, there's basil, there's some rosemary and calendula um, in the middle to give it some height. So that's all edible, everything in that box. I ended up um, putting it in the, putting the liner with all the plants in it in the garage and overwintered it and the strawberries came back. And so this year I just filled it in with Swiss chard. Those are Johnny Jump Ups, so that's an edible viola. Um, what else do I have in there? Some parsley and some oregano. So again, all, all edibles. Um, and it'll look really pretty, especially as the chard grows in. So that's pr fairly newly planted um, and already looking pretty. So you can see where it's, where it's headed. Here's another one that's all edible. So that's nasturtium in the foreground. Uh, it's a variety with a really pretty variegated leaf. So even the leaf without the flowers is pretty. There's um, a nice use of texture so that red leaf lettuce behind it. There's some spiky chives behind it. So you can create, you know, a really pretty container just by thinking about color and texture uh, amongst the edibles. But you don't have to make it all edibles. You can mix in ornamentals, things that you wouldn't eat with your edibles. So um, Pan American Seeds started doing, you might've seen these in the garden center. They call them the plug and play. So it's a, basically a container that they've, the growers already seeded and mixed up. Um, so it's, it's ready to go. Um, and they called this one Foodie Blues. And so they used a, a, an eggplant called Patio Baby that was an All-American Selections winner. They used a, a basil that was also a winner and then regular purple petunias. So when the purple eggplant grow, it'll look really pretty with those petunias. So it doesn't have to be all edibles in your container. You can mix and match things that you eat and things that just look nice. Hey, Leslie, can we pause for a second? Because we do have a few questions that are kind of building up. So um, do you mind if I pass them along? Sure. sure. Um, so one of them was, um, do, are you recommending to just cover the ground with mulch and then uh, let it incorporate into the clay? That was um, I, yeah, I wouldn't cover it with mul mulch per se. I was saying you could use something like a compost or composted manure or mushroom compost um, you apply it like you would a mulch. So put a good four inches down and let it sit for a couple of weeks and the worms will work that into the soil. Or if you're in a hurry, which almost every gardener is, then you can just use a, a pitchfork or a metal rake or a shovel and just sort of toss it, toss it into the first couple of inches of soil. And that'll make it a much more hospitable planting bed for the edibles you want to put in. Okay, another question was, how many lettuce seeds did you put in the bowl? Um, so I am uh, frugal, so I end up, key I never use a whole packet of seeds. Well, two things, I'm frugal and I like variety, so I get a little of everything that I plant. So I have seed that is not necessarily fresh, so I end up just throw in a bunch of seed in there. And if it's too much, I just thin and pick it out. But you just, um, you basically just scatter it. So I don't know. I mean, some people put it in like a, a tin can with holes in it or a shaker, like a, a cheese shaker. But I just eyeball it and I kind of just sprinkle it across the surface, press it in so that the wind and the watering can don't blow all the seed out. Um, and yeah, that's it. Okay, and uh, can you purchase flowers like pansies from a greenhouse and eat them? That is a good question. I suppose you could. Um, 
the only thing you don't you, the only thing you don't know is if they were treated with anything but i guess that's the same as if you buy conventional produce in the grocery store you just have to make sure you wash it really well um but all those things like they're all the edible flowers i listed are also really really easy to grow from seed it's probably a little late now so I, not all of them though some of them you could just throw seed in and still get flowers Okay, I just have one quick question too. And I'm not yes. trying to be cheeky, but have you ever created, like when you put all those seeds together, does anything ever grow like new that you haven't seen before? Like I know sometimes plants kind of intermingle. Yep, so that happens. That gets into whether something has been hybridized or whether it's a true seed. And since I tend to use organic seeds and heirloom seeds, they, they sort of, they reproduce true to what they are. But if you have something, you'll see sometimes on the seed packet, it'll say F1. Um, that's, a, that's a clue that it's been hybridized and those you can't really, um, you can't really reproduce as is. There's also some things that, um, well, the pollinators will mix from one variety to the other variety. And I have had that happen. I had some mutant squash one year but they weren't mutant squash. I didn't save the squash seeds and try to grow them. They just sort of grew naturally. And I'm a sucker for plants that grow out of the compost. So I just <laughs> let it go. And it turned out to be some weird mutant inedible squash. So, oh, well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. You can continue, thanks. Okay. Um, this was just my plug for eggplants since that was in the last slide. Um, you can get so many different, that's that one on the top left, that's called Rosa Bianca. It's just a beautiful, even if you don't like to eat it, it's just so pretty to look at. It gets these lavender and on white stripes. You can get Asian eggplant, which are the long, thin ones. And even the flowers are pretty as you see on the bottom left. So even if you don't like to eat them, but I encourage eating them, I think you just need to find a good recipe. I'm finding not, not a lot of people like eggplant. Um, so as I said though, edible flowers are kind of the best of both worlds. So these are all flowers in my garden. So um, I'm gonna go clockwise from upper left. So that's, that's a calendula or so it's, it looks a little bit like a marigold, really easy to grow. The, that, then there's bronze fennel, nasturtium. Those are garlic chives. That's borage, which is an herb. Um, sometimes called star flower, as you can see, it looks like a star. And then there's the Johnny Jump Ups, uh, which is a, also a viola. And so all those, um, I've made, I've made the most beautiful little cream cheese mini sandwiches with edible flowers on them. You can do infused vinegars with those. You can um, put them into salads to just make your salad look extra fancy. And they all have a, a certain flavor. It's not like you're eating a whole bowl of flowers, um, but it's fun. It's really fun to grow edible flowers. Um, here's another container um, that, I, again, it's pretty recently planted. And again, I grew these all from seed, but there's some rainbow chart in the middle to kind of give some height. I've got scarlet runner beans that are going to grow up those um, old tree branches and then a trailing nasturtium that's going to fall over the side so you kind of think about when you're making your container where, where you're going to get your height or what they call your thriller what's going to be your spiller that spills over the the edge and trails down gracefully and then what's your filler that's sort of going to you know pack out the mid-range of the of the pot and nasturtium is a great one because you can you can tell on the seed packet, there's some that are called trailing, there's some that are climbing that'll go up across a fence or you know up a trellis, um, and there's some that are just mounding that look even really nice on the ground, and they're just going to create a really pretty mound with oodles of flowers. And um, it tastes kind of peppery, and you can eat the flowers and those little lily pad looking leaves are also um, edible. Um, another kind of container idea that I love is planting, this is great with kids especially, um, is doing a themed garden. So you can do a pizza garden or a ratatouille garden and either on the right, you can just plant all the ingredients for pizza in one container. In this case, it's a you know whiskey barrel planter. Or you can have a collection of individual planters that have 
you know, like in this one, one has the tomato, one has the eggplant, one has the pepper, throw some herbs in there and you've got ratatouille. Um, I mentioned potatoes. So this is how I grew my potatoes last year. Those are just um, old coffee sacks, burlap sacks. And how you grow potatoes is you start them covered in a little soil. And then as they sprout, roll the bag up, put a little more soil over them to cover. They sprout again, rinse and repeat until you've got the whole bag filled. And then you do it that way. It maximizes how many um, tubers are getting created under the level of the soil, but it looked really cool. And I had a whole bunch of delicious, delicious heirloom potatoes at the end of it. Um, this is, these are some shots I took a few years ago from the uh, Chicago Flower and Garden Show. This was the Peterson Community Garden, um, their uh, booth or garden display. And I, they did a wonderful job showing how when you say container, it doesn't even have to be a pot that was designed for that purpose. So here you can see they've, they've got repurposed a dresser to have all sorts of delicious greens growing out of the dresser. They've got in the background um, tin cans hanging off a, a, a fence. They've got some uh, concrete cement blocks to the right that you can use to create a really modern looking planter. And then um, those are just gutter downspouts um, on the upper left that they've got some salad greens growing in. The key thing is just as long as there's holes in the bottom so the, the water can drain, um, it can be a container. Oh, and if you look at the, the chair in the bottom left, you can just see peeking out that book, The Drunken Botanist, which I'm gonna to get to later. <laughs> um, here, here again on the left is from the Peterson Garden uh, display, like how they used old ladders and created that just really beautiful collection of terracotta pots to create a little herb garden. You can use your, you know, McCain's steel cut oats, you know, to create an herb garden on an old ladder. It's just charming. Um, here's even a colander that can be turned into a hanging basket for more strawberries or, or a wheelbarrow. So really a chance with container gardening to get, to get super creative. Here's a, a whole stack that once the plants grow in, it, it even creates a privacy screen if you're trying to sort of shield your patio from the street or the neighbors. Um, there's a lot you can do. So I'm gonna pause, were there any other questions before I move on to the vertical? Yeah, we had a couple. Uh, first, what is the name of the mini eggplant that you had mentioned? Um, well, I am going to tell you, but I also just planted one called oh, Prince. What, are, what is it? Fa fairy tale eggplant. There's a number of of ones, but I'm going to have to uh, let me just consult my notes here. Patio Baby was the one in that slide. Okay. Um, and then we had a question. How do you prevent rabbits from eating your edible plants? Well, uh, my neighbor just asked me this. So I don't, well, maybe because I have two golden retrievers. And so there might just be dog threat that keeps them out. But I don't, I don't fence anything off. So I think that's one of the benefits as we talked about with foodscaping is that it's not like there's one huge rabbit buffet that once they get in, they're going to just eat everything. It's all interspersed throughout your property. So it becomes, you know, you might lose one cabbage, but you're not going to lose all the cabbages because they're not all planted in a nice little row uh, for the bunnies. Okay. And uh, the last one, and I was thinking the exact same thing as this customer, how do they water the plants that are in that desk? <laughs> um, yeah, you would just, well, of course they didn't because this was just a display garden at the flower and garden show, but um, you basically just wouldn't use a pretty dresser that you're ever going to want to use, you know, as a piece of furniture again. So you, you just water it. They have holes in the bottom that would just, they let it weather naturally. Um, and, you know, it's not going to last forever, 
you'll maybe get two or three seasons out of it, but it just becomes more um, of a of a whimsical piece in the garden. Okay, perfect. That was all the questions for this section. Um, but just so you know, there are lots of comments too about how adorable all of these uh, <laughs> setups are. So. Thanks. Good, then hopefully people will do it. So then um, vertical gardening is the next section. So there's a whole bunch of plants that do really good. They're sort of climbers or vines, like peas, pole beans, runner beans, nasturtium, malabar spinach. You can grow hardy kiwi in our area, uh, cucumber squash, tomatoes, tomatillos, and melons. So um, this is actually a picture from years ago. I worked with Thomas Middle School to kick off their garden. Um, and we grew these amazing Asian long beans, which if you can, see, I don't know if you get a sense of scale in this picture, but they, they get to up to two feet long. They're just the coolest looking things. And it could, this was a trellis just made of crisscross bamboo poles. Um, and it created, it was like a living wall or a living screen. It was very cool. Um, this is just a different kind of pole bean. It's called purple potted pole bean. <laughs> Say that three times fast. Um, and it sort of illustrates another principle that, yeah, I could have grown green beans, but green beans are so pedestrian. Why not grow purple beans? So um, I always in foodscaping try to look for unusual colors or unexpected colors um, just to just purely for the aesthetics. Um, case in point, these are some snow peas. They're an, an Indian variety of snow pea that makes, rather than green peas, they're this really pretty pale yellow. And even the flowers are that gorgeous sort of maroon and purple bicolored flower. So that's a beautiful plant that looks pretty while it's growing and is really, really delicious to eat. <laughs> um, here's scarlet runner beans. I use these a lot because they grow so fast so they can cover a trellis um, in just a few weeks really and they produce masses and masses of these bright red scarlet flowers sometimes they're bicolor that's a different version um, in the close-up picture that has sort of like a pale pink with the red um, but the Beans themselves are edible you kind of have to get them when they're young because otherwise they get kind of big and they can be very tough. Um, but the flowers are edible too. Um, and a lot of times I just grow it purely as an ornamental because it's just such a pretty vine and the seeds are really easy to save. So I have like a ball jar full of scarlet runner bean seeds that I tried to plant everywhere and I still can't find places to plant. So that's a good one. Um, and here's cucumbers. We're not used to seeing cucumbers in containers, but I thought this was interesting to see side by side. You can kind of do a DIY just using fallen tree branches. You know, don't pay to have the landscaping, you know, company take them away or, or group to come take them away. You can make a trellis just with twine um, and have something that will support the cucumber as it grows. Or you can have something a little bit more formal as in the right hand picture. And um, this was a top tip on if you want to use tomato cages to support any of these vining or you know heavier things like tomatoes, obviously, or cucumber, squash, um, you can just paint them like black if you want them to sort of disappear into the environment and not be as noticeable. Or you can get creative and if you wanted to pick a color and you could paint the tomato cage and suddenly it's garden art, it's not it's not something you'd be embarrassed to have in the front of your house. Um, this is a picture of actually a little bit of a mature Malabar spinach. So Malabar spinach, um, it's not a true spinach botanically. It's actually a tropical vine, also grown in India. Um, this is a red veined variety because then even the stems are that really deep, deep purple. But all the leaves are, are, you can eat just like you would spinach. So you can eat it raw in a salad, you can, you can saute it, you can eat it however you would spinach. Um, what you see in this picture though, this is sort of late in the season. 
So maybe not as delicious to eat now because it's already flowered. All those little pale green and pink globes are actually the flower. And then they turn into those droops, they're called, those little dark purple berry looking things that um, you can then collect and dry. And those are the seeds to plant your crop next year. But it's a really, really pretty plant. And unlike regular spinach, it's really hard to grow here because it gets too hot. All my spinach is already bolted. It's no good. But Malabar spinach loves the heat, so you can grow that all summer. And I don't grow this, but I learned in preparing for this presentation about hardy kiwi. So if you have, they do need a good sunny spot and a pretty strong arbor or trellis. Um, they have this beautiful pink foliage and edible fruit. You can grow kiwi in Arlington Heights. And then lastly, this is another technique. I think these are just like, um, you know, Ikea like shoe bags, you know, canvas shoe bags, but that they put on a wall or a, a decking fence and tucked, you know, they have soil in there and they're growing all those beautiful herbs vertically rather than growing them flat in the garden. Okay, pause. Questions? All right. Um, I'm, and again, I'm not sure which bean they were referring to, but what is the name? Someone asked, what is the name of the bean again, please? Um, so I don't know. I, I know you talked about the scarlet running bean. Was there another bean that you had mentioned? Yeah, scarlet runner. Runner. Um, R-U-N-N-E-R. -N -N -E um, there was an Asian long bean. That's the two foot long bean. You, you eat that just like, a, just like a green bean, you know, a string bean. It's just really long. So I tend to, if I leave it long, I kind of stir fry it or you just chop it up into, mm -hmm. you know, two inch pieces and, and cook it like you would a green bean. Um, what other beans did I have? Then there was a purple potted pole bean. The so, one with all, she says the one with all the pretty flowers. That was the scarlet runner bean. Okay. Um, and then we have another question. Uh, where can we find the starter plants for the Scarlet Runner bean and the Malabar spinach? I have never seen them. Like that's why um, buying a packet of seeds, but the beauty of those is you only have to buy one packet of seeds and they're, they're big seeds. They're really easy to save and then plant again next year and you never have to buy another seed packet. Okay, thank you. Uh, what was the name of the Indian yellow snap pea? Um, it different um, because it's one of these seeds that were sort of discovered at a market in India. So different seed companies call it different things. But if you just look for um, a yellow, uh, um, a yellow snow pea, it's so ironic that it's a snow pea because it's from trop the tropics, but it's a snow pea meaning it's, a, it's the flat one that never, you don't have to shell it. They're not big round peas. It's the flat pea pod that you, you stir fry or eat raw in salads. Okay, and then um, the, kind of a, a related to that, uh, where can you get the seeds if you can't get the starter plants? Um, so I, the seed companies I like to use um, are Baker Creek, it has a lot of these seeds. Um, Seed Savers Exchange is another one. Um, Renee's Garden Seeds is a, a third one. Okay, and if then- If there weren't 130 people or however many there are on this, I would share my seeds because do I even have them? I have so many Scarlet Runner bean seeds. <laughs> oh yeah, we have 71 people, so. <laughs> oh, I might, I might have 71 seeds. <laughs> Um, so uh, then someone asked you, how do you preserve your seeds? And, and I think this goes along with it. And how many years can you keep them once they're preserved? Right. Okay. So um, most seeds, with notable exceptions, but most seeds are going to retain some kind of viability for three to five years. Um, that's why I overseed a lot of times though, because I'm always worried that it's not gonna have as much viability as if it were fresh from the, right from the year before. Um, but I, like the Scarlet Runner beans, I just leave them up there 
I leave, you know, I don't pick all the beans. The beans will eventually turn brown and then yellow and then crispy. And then I go in and crack them open and you'll see the, the seeds are about the size of like your first thumb knuckle and they're beautiful. I wish, oh, hold please. <laughs> Oh, wait, these are calendula. Wait, sorry, they're back here. Okay. So here they are in my magnesium pill bottle. <laughs> That's what I save them in. But you can see how big they are. And they're really pretty. I don't know if you can see on my camera, but they're sort of red and purple swirly ones. I have another variety that's sort of like a tan and caramel colored. So I, I just let them, you know, as long as they're dried and then I, I put them in old, in this case, an old vitamin container because they're so big and I have so many. If it's smaller seeds, I just put them in little, little envelopes um the key thing is they just need to be dry if they're wet they're gonna mold or mildew and they're gonna be ruined or they're gonna try to sprout early so you just make sure you keep them somewhere on a paper plate or a paper towel or some newspaper until everything's really dry and then you put it in a sealed envelope or a pill bottle or old spice jars and put them somewhere dark where it's not going to get too hot too cold and they'll be they'll be good to use in the spring. Okay, that answered the next question, which was, is there any special way to dry them? But you already explained that. Um, so another guest would like to know if we still have time to plant. Yes, absolutely. It depends, well, okay. Yes, certain things. There's some things that it's too late to start from seed because they take so long to germinate and to grow that you wouldn't get enough out of them before they before it gets cold in the fall but other things like um like cucumbers squash pole beans green beans um, lettuce kale swiss chard all that stuff in fact you you want to do what's called succession planning you don't plan it all at once because then everything's going to be ready to eat all at once and you can't eat that much. So you sort of plant a little bit of seed every couple of weeks so that you have a little bit you can harvest as you go along through the season. So there's still time to plant uh, all those things. Uh, what about specifically the scarlet runner beans? Are there still, is there still time for that? Yes, there is. Oh, perfect. Okay, and then another guest asked, how often do you reseed your lettuce bowls? Um, Probably only once because as I said, I have that, um, you know, I use leaf lettuce that I can just cut and it keeps growing back. The, the thing that will kill your lettuce is if, it, if it's in hot sun and it's, it's hot like it has been, it can bolt, you know, which basically means it sends up a thick flower stalk mm -hmm. so that it can spread its seed and you know carry on the next generation and once it does that the lettuce is going to taste really bitter and not, not be very good so um i keep mine sort of in a like a pergola area so it's not in baking hot sun so it seems to do okay okay great i think we're good from now okay okay so then um the third uh, format is just um, in garden beds, borders, and edging. So this is along my, uh, let's see, south edge of my house. And so you can even see in there, there in the background, there's some scarlet runner bean growing up. I have some bronze fennel flowers. There's borage, there's zinnias. There's a lot going on in that, in that border. Um, and there's all, there's a all kinds of things that look great in terms of edibles that are pretty enough to sort of, you know, have at the front of your house tucked in with your, your flowers and your shrubs. Um, that includes this long list that I guess I'll read kale, chard, cabbage, cress, bok choy, mustard, shiso, lettuce, red vein sorrel, bush beans, runner beans, all kinds of herbs, leeks, onions, peppers, eggplant, okra, carrots, 
beets, fennel, bush squash, bush cucumbers. Um, and depending on your style, this can be, you can use these, this to be kind of loose and organic, um, as we see on the left side of the screen, or it can be more formal on the right side of the screen. So the left, there's, they've got some cabbages, ornamental cabbages, looks like some collard greens, some onions and lettuces growing amongst, you know, the daffodils and other kinds of um, spring bulbs. And then on the right, they've got a some huge rainbow chard. They also have the ornamental cabbage and then two perfectly lined up rows of, of some hot peppers. Um, one thing, because there's, I mean, I don't even know how many varieties of lettuce there must be. Like in, I personally probably have 30 right now. <laughs> so there's got, there's a lot. And one of the things you can do with the different colors and different textures is you can think about it as almost painting in your beds. You can create different patterns. Um, you know, I've seen checkerboards, you can sort, you can do stripes. Um, it can, you can be quite creative and painterly. Um, we talked about um, how I like to use unexpected colors. Um, so those are jalapenos on the left. Those were our purple jalapenos, which are really, really pretty. I mean, green, green jalapenos are pretty too, but purple are just so striking. And that's a, a bell pepper on the right that also comes in sort of a rosy hue. Um, okra is another, uh, okra is actually, not many people like to eat it, but it's a very pretty plant to grow because of the pods themselves and the flowers. And this variety, it's called candle fire okra, has these really striking red stems and pods. Um, so that would look, that would look beautiful in a flower bed. Um, these are just three herbs that um, I, I, I give special mention to because they're not as common, but they're really, uh, really beautiful in the garden. So um, that's a, a pineapple sage that is a hummingbird magnet. You can see why it's got those long red flowers that the hummingbirds absolutely love. And the sage is just, you know, it's a, it kind of has a pineapple flavor uh, to the sage, really lovely plant. The right is um, lemongrass. So that would look just as pretty as any ornamental grass you might be growing on your property. But this one you can eat. And the bonus is um, apparently it repels mosquitoes. So lemongrass is a great one. You can see how big it gets. Um, and it technically it's uh, a perennial, but it doesn't tend to survive our winters. So I grow mine in a pot that I can bring in in the winter and then put back out in the spring. And then the bottom, that one's a purple shiso. So shiso is also called perilla. Um, it's an Asian herb. It's uh, the red one they use. That's what makes the uh, the pickled ginger at sushi restaurants pink. That's from that, that shiso. It's got... Um, it's a really complex flavor, but if you do, if you like a lot of Asian cooking, um, or if you just like something pretty, it has those frilly purple leaves. It's a really gorgeous plant. And then um, Swiss chard is another champion of the, of the foodscape because it comes in all these, I don't have all the colors shown in my pictures, but most of them, um, it comes red stems, yellow stems, white stems, pink stems, um, there's a bright lights variety um, that has almost these neon colors to the stems. Uh, it's striking and, and Swiss chard is one of those things that you can cut a few leaves off of it. It'll grow more leaves. It'll just keep producing for you. And um, it won't, it can, it can take our, our heat. It can take a hot, you know, Arlington Heights summer and not fade. So that's a really good one. And then um, summer squash. So we all kind of think zucchini and maybe remember our grandparents' gardens or our parents' gardens and they had like the monster zucchini vines that took over. You can buy bush varieties. So patty pan or scallop squash, these little flying saucer squash um, grow in a really compact bush size and you get oodles of these delicious little uh, squash. They come in yellow, white, pale apple green like this. There's a dark green you can get. 
And of course the flowers are edible too. So you can harvest them um, and, you know, stuff them with cheese and fry them or bake them. And they're, they're, they're quite delicious. Um, here's just a, a nice example of a foodscape where they show how you can create an edible edge. So the front row is a globe basil. So it grows in that nice sort of round bush habit. And then behind it is a taller purple basil um, that creates an edging. And this one, so I have the, on the left is um, uh, marjoram or wild oregano. And th that comes back every year for me. That started to just grow as a ground cover under my hydrangeas. It comes back every year. The right is the, um, Creeping thyme, which also comes back every year. I've got that in my front. It sort of softens the edge of the paving stones on a front patio. And then the middle, this doesn't come back. That's a, that's a red mustard, but I had a plant that self-seeded and it created this literal sea of baby little mustard greens that I've, I've been, you know, just snipping like it's a, my little micro green garden. So there's a lot of things you can you can use as sort of edges or ground covers. Onions and garlic look really pretty edging a, a formal garden bed. You can use bush beans, lettuce, strawberries, and beets. I would really recommend this beet. This is a variety called bull's blood. Um, and you can see that the, the leaves of the plant are actually this deep, deep red color. It's really um, pretty as a edging in a, in a garden bed. And then I'll pause if there's any questions before going on to the next section. Um, I think the only question for this section was, um, where can we buy a lemongrass starter plant? Oh, uh, probably you'd have to go to, I got mine at a plant sale so I haven't necessarily seen them. I may have seen them at the big box stores once in a while because Burpee might have one that they are selling out at Home Depot. Um, but I, it, it's not as common. So you might want to call before you make a special trip somewhere. Oh, thanks. One of our guests said that they bought one, uh, bought lemongrass at Pesci's. Perfect. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, and someone said Didier Farms as well. Oh, great. Excellent. Um, okay, so then the last section is on fruit bearing perennials. So that's a picture of a, a flowering quince or a Japanese quince that I have. Sadly, the, that variety I have, it's really pretty. It's called Scarlet Storm, but it doesn't make any fruit. Um, but most varieties, it, the flowering quince produces a fruit that is great in, you know, jams, jellies. The Brits really, really love their, themselves a quince jelly. Um, but I do have this one. This is a Cornelian cherry dogwood, um, which is a great uh, shrub. It's sort of, it almost looks like a tree the way I've pruned it. Um, but it's a large shrub that produces masses of these yellow, uh, almost, you know, almost like, um, I'm blanking out the spring, the spring flowering shrub with the yellow. I, I don't know. I'm having a blank, but it creates masses of yellow flowers. And then when it produces its fruits, thank you for Cynthia. <laughs> thank you. I was waiting for somebody to, there we go. Everybody's going to pile in for Cynthia. <laughs> Um, and these are the Cornelian cherries. They're like a, the size and shape of an olive. And um, you, can, you can use those kind of the way you would a cranberry. So people will add them to a, an apple pie or stud a muffin um, with them or make a cranberry or a, a, a Cornelian cherry uh, relish. Um, they're super nutritious. Um, so it's a good, a good all purpose plant. Um, this one's the black chokeberry. It's a smaller shrub, also a spring bloomer, all these white flowers. Um, even when I pruned it, I brought it in because I had it in a jar on the right. It's a really pretty blossom. And then those are the, 
those are the berries. Um, chokeberry doesn't sound so good. You may have heard of aronia. That's what that's what the marketers call it um, because it's sort of like this new superfood. It's even more antioxidants than in a blueberry. Um, and you kind of use those as you would blueberries. It's a little more bitter than a blueberry. So I, I tend to use it um, mixed in with other berries, but yeah, that's my harvest. So you get a pretty shrub and some berries. Um, what's this guy? Wait, hold on. Hold on. I've lost my place. No, I don't know. Is that elderberry? No, I think it's just more pictures of the same. No, I know what I did. That's service berry. That's not, this is, sir this is the service berry, Shadblow service berry, sometimes called June berry. This is the large shrub, and this is the choke berry called Aronia. That was my confusion. And then, um, and then the last one is red bud, which a lot of people may be growing red bud and didn't realize the blossoms are edible. So um, I teach kids cooking classes before we had our shelter in place order. We, we had one class, we were gonna make these beautiful little Vietnamese spring rolls where, uh, where you put the red bud inside and it makes these beautiful, uh, beautiful little tasty treats. Um, so that's another surprising edible that um, also is quite beautiful in the landscape. Of course, there's plenty of other trees and shrubs that grow in our zone that produce edible fruits and, and nuts that I don't grow, um, <laughs> but you can, like apples, pears, peaches, plums, persimmons, cherries, apricots we can grow here, fig, walnut, chestnut hazelnuts, blueberries, currants, gooseberries, and pawpaws. So quite a few perennial fruit bearing trees and shrubs. Um, and then as I wrap up, I wanted to, I have this, the second one is the Foodscape Revolution. I actually have that checked out, but I'm gonna bring it back to the library tomorrow. <laughs> So you can check it out. There's a number of books that Tracy's going to email this tomorrow um, with the with the questionnaire or the survey survey um, of that are available at the library, both physical books and eBooks. Um, that if you want to go a little bit deeper into the specifics of edible landscaping, you, there's a great um, eBook at the bottom there, uh, the Gardener's Guide to Compact Plants which is you know, good to look for specific varieties of what you can grow you know, in a window box or if you just have a little pot on your deck or you need a, something that's gonna be small and compact, that's a good resource. And then uh, since everybody is suddenly way more interested in gardening, I would like to invite anyone if they wanna check out the Arlington Heights Garden Club has both a website and a Facebook page and they're the most generous, knowledgeable group of people that are always willing to give advice, answer questions. Um, so please check that out. And, and that's me. If anybody has any follow-up questions, um, that's my, my email and my Facebook page. Um, I'd be happy to carry on the conversation and any questions we missed, I can, I can get to offline. Oh, yeah, we also have a few like uh, just last minute questions. Um, what edible plants are good to grow that won't spread and are perennials? Um, well, oh, edible perennials that won't spread. Asparagus is an edible perennial that, I mean, I guess it, technically it can spread, but it takes years and years to spread. Um, I don't, I mean, all those, all those trees and shrubs that I have, like my, my service berry and choke berry, they do send up occasional, you know, suckers that they'll, but it's, it's not unwieldy. It's really easy to just cut those down if you don't want it to spread. It's not invasive. Okay, we have another question. What is the best time of day to water the veggies? 
Um, we just heard this on the myths, right? The gardening myths. Yeah, we did. <laughs> that's, that essentially, um, we learned that it was a myth that the sun's going to burn the water droplets on the plants if you do it midday. So essentially, whenever you can get around to it, um, just not too close to nightfall because you don't want the leaves to be sort of cold and damp. That's just, that's creating a culture for fungus and all kinds of bad things. So, you know, you can water anytime in the morning or afternoon. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? All right, well, if not, um, let me thank you for um, attending tonight. Oh, wait, wait, here's one. Do deer like the survive berries or choke berries? Um, I have had all kinds of wildlife in my yard, but never deer. So I don't, I don't think so. I mean, deer will eat anything if it's winter and they're starving, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna chew on the, the bark, but I don't, um, uh, deer are the one pest I haven't had. So I can't answer that one definitively. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions. Let me um, thank you guys for coming and let you know that um, you will be receiving an email, um, as Leslie mentioned, and I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, with a survey from the library um, and the links to some of the resources that Leslie provided. Um, also, uh, make sure you check out www.ahml.info for all of our virtual programs. Um, we have a bunch of great ones uh, throughout the month of June and uh, for as long as we are in any kind of quarantine, there will be virtual library programs coming to you from Arlington Heights Memorial Library. So um, if you have any questions or anything, you can always uh, give the library a call or shoot us an email and um, that's it. I'd like to say good night, stay healthy and well. We'll talk to you soon, thanks.